Today, we're going to talk about ultra fine machining using hand tools. Hey guys, welcome back to Metal Tips and Tricks. My name's Dale. Today, we're going to talk about scraping, and scraping is the skill or the art of removing little pieces of metal, scraping them off to develop an incredibly flat surface. Now you ask, why would you do that? Well, some people think, well, a milling machine is great. Well, a milling machine is accurate, let's say, over six inches, maybe a half a thousandth if your machine's in good shape. If your machine's in bad shape, well, let's just say accuracy is a relative term. Then we talk about surface grinders. Surface grinders are great. You can grind accuracies down to two tenths, really, really easy. But the problem is you only have a certain amount of surface on your surface grinder. You could do that work. If you had a piece that was too large, it wouldn't fit on the magnet. You have to do it a different way. And that's where scraping it by hand comes into play. So the other reason you scrape something by hand is actually develop what we call a bearing surface. That is two metal surfaces that slide together. Now when we scrape this, the surface, well, let me show you. Here's a beautifully scraped surface, and what it has, it has a series of high spots, but all these high spots are exactly at the same place, so that also means there's valleys or low areas where oil can go in and stay. It stays very well lubricated and will last a lot longer set up this way. But before I get started, I want to give a shout out to Jonathan at Core Print Castings. He actually supplied the castings that I'm going to be working on today. He supplied this 45 degree angle dovetail. It's 18 inches long. He also supplied the 16 by 8 inch square. This is going to be set up for another video. This video is actually about scraping for alignment. This one here is about scraping for flatness, but what we do here applies here. Too far. Let's talk about what we need to scrape. First of all, we need an object to scrape. We've got V block here I'm going to do some tests on. We also need different types of hand scrapers. We need some bluing ink. We need a paintbrush to wipe off chips. We also have some precision ground flat stones, and we also need a granite surface plate like this here. Now, this granite surface plate, I like it because it's small, it's simple, I can actually pick it up and take it over to other areas. That's a great one, that's only a grade B, actually a little too short for what I'm doing, but I am just doing a demonstration. When I do the final work on this, it'll be done on my larger surface plate. Other thing you want to be cognizant of is how do you hold your material? And that's up to you. You've got to find a great way because I've got this set up on a very sturdy table. Also a magnetic chuck off an old uh, surface grinder. So when I grab it, it stays into place. Great, great way of doing it. So what is scraping? So scraping is when we're going to scrape off little bits of material at a time in a very, very controlled fashion. And we also have a way of measuring that by using a granite surface plate and also spotting dies. But we'll get into that in a little bit. Right now, I want to talk about scrapers and the different types of scrapers. Now, scrapers don't have to be fancy. You can actually, here's the very first scraper I ever made. You can see that it's actually an old planer blade with a radius ground in on it. I use this for quite a long time. You can also just take an ordinary file. So if you want to play around with it, you don't need a bunch of fancy tools. So the different types of scrapers I'm going to be showing today is I've got a large, medium, a small, and then I've got something that Tom Lipton came up with and I copied. I'm looking forward to talking about that. But one so, thing you want to be concerned with when scraping is how much material you're removing. And we control that by three ways. One is we control it by pressure, distance we scrape, and the way we grind this radius here. I work with four different radiuses, and I've got a little radius gauge that I made here. Um, I've got 140 set up here, a 90, a 60, and this one here is 40. And what we're trying to do is control how wide the scrape mark is when we scrape. Here is my big heavy scraper. This one here has a radius of 140 centimeters. And when we're talking centimeters instead of inches, I don't know why. That's just kind of the industry standard, so I'm just gonna stay with it. And the flatter this is, the wider the channel is it's going to make. So let me show you here. So if I come in here and scrape, you can see how wide this is. Now if we go in with one with a medium radius, this one here I think is set up to a 60. Now look at how wide it is. And that's the, the more refined radius. Then we can go down to something really small. This one here is a 40. And even smaller. Now you'll also see that 
the length of the scrape changes how much material we're removing. And the more we press down, the deeper we Small, go. So let's, let's do something interesting here. Let's actually measure how deep these grooves are. I've already ground this in, and we'll actually measure how deep these scrapes are. Go with the next one, the medium. And then the fine. Now I've got something to measure here. Disadvantage to using a magnetic chuck is, well, metal filings stick to it. So let me get set up here so we can make some measurements. So let's bring this in and zero this out. This indicator is a tenth indicator, so every mark on there is a ten thousandth of an inch. Let's see what kind of depth we get here. So that's a half a thousandth. Four tenths, how's the length on this? So we're averaging about a half a thousandth on each stroke. Let's go to the medium. Well, the medium's hitting about four tenths, and we'll go to the small. It's hitting about three tenths. I find that really interesting. I expect it to be a bigger discrepancy between all of these. So they're all within about two tenths. But I just found this really an interesting test to see what's going on. Let's talk about surface plates. So here's a small granite surface plate. I actually got it at a woodworking store. Those guys use these to put sandpaper on them and use them for sharpening. Um, it's actually too small for this job, but I'm actually just doing a demonstration. I'll finish this whole thing up on my big surface plate. So we've talked about three different types of scrapers and how to control how much material you're scraping off by pressure, distance, and the radius on the end of the scraper. Now we want to talk about bluing. And bluing, people call it all sorts of things. We're just going to stick to the word bluing. We're going to use two different types of spotting dyes are actually colors. We're going to have a blue and a yellow. The yellow is the highlighter. But what we need to do now is cover how we put down the ink. And this is, to me, really, really critical. A lot of people ignore this step and shame on them because it's so critical because if you put it down too thick, you'll get a false reading. And there's several different levels, just like we have different types of scrapers and different radiuses. Well, I look at putting ink down as something you have to be able to control accurately. And we're going to have three, actually four different levels of it, where we're going to have a thick coat, a medium coat, a thin coat, and then no coat at all. I know it's kind of cool to think of that. When we get to a certain point, when we're starting to get down to 40 points, the ink is actually too thick, and you can't get a really a strong reading. And that's where... We'll put, the, put our object down that we're scraping, and when it's really good, and you're really getting refined, you'll actually move this around, and it will polish up. Can you see these little facets in here? Those are all high spots that when we're at this point, we'll scrape these off. But I want to show you different thicknesses, and this is the way that I do it. I don't say that it's the right way. I say it's my way. But actually, let me back up. Let me talk about how other people put down their dye. They'll have another plate over here, a piece of glass. They will put their dye on there, squeegee it out with a roller, and then bring it over to here. I have never liked that system because I don't have the control that I want. What I'm going to do here is we're going to put down a real thin coat, and I'm going to develop what I call a formula. And I'm just going to go in with two dots, and we're going to spread this out. Get that wheel rolling. As you can see, it's just kind of repeating. And we want to make sure that we squeegee this ink out through the whole thing. Now, what's great about this type of dye that we're using, actually, it's a paint. It's not a dye. But people will call it a dye. It's actually water-based, but it doesn't dry out. Usually, use an oil base. You can actually go to, to an art supply store and get an oil you know, for like paintings. And the reason the oil was so popular for so long is because it doesn't dry out. Well, they've come up with new formulas now, and they've actually come up with artist paints that don't dry out, that are water-based, and you can clean these up really easy. Now you can see I've got a nice thin coat here. Let's do a rubbing. I need to put a highlighter on this. And we're going to go with the yellow. The yellow is, of course, if you remember your art class, is the opposite of blue, so it's going to give us some contrast. And we're going to rub that in nice and deep. Now, why do they use blue? Well, I think blue is one of those colors that has traditionally been used since the beginning of time. There are other colors you can use. The problem with blue is, well, steel is kind of a blue color. And 
it doesn't give you enough contrast, so you have to go in with the yellow highlighter to give it separation. So again, why blue? Well, blue is one of these colors back in antiquity. Blue is a very hard color to mix to get it dark enough because the pigment in blue is so fine. Well, if you think about it, we want something that is a real, real fine, fine pigment so it doesn't build up any thickness in the ink. And I think that's why blue is still so popular as they, people think in those terms. So now you see this? See how that's set up? Now look at where all these high spots are. Anywhere there's blue, that's a high spot. You know when I talked about dots per inch, we put this down, this one inch square, and we count up the dots. How many dots do we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. And I'm kind of cheating on that because some of them are a little bit larger, but I see if I cut that in half, cut that one in half, cut that in half. So this one is done pretty nice, but you can see how the high spots are set up and how much better the yellow helps the separation. Now let's go to the next level. Like I said, I'm trying to set up a formula here. I set this up and I just use two dots. Let's see what happens. Let's add three. I want you to see this build up. And I think you're understanding what I'm trying to do here is develop a formula because as I put ink on here, this becomes less ink here. And eventually you have to keep re-inking it. Now you can also see right now, I put on too much, but I'm gonna prove my point here in a second. And you wanna get this even. If there's any thick spots, you're gonna get a false rub there. And you can listen to this. And you'll hear the roller and you'll also feel the roller and you'll kind of know when it's out of position. Now, this is also something you have to keep very, very clean. If you get any dust on this, well, you're kind of screwed. So let's go for another reading. Now, actually, this end here is really a good example of a false rub. See what happens when I put down the ink thicker? I'm not getting as accurate rubbing as I should. And now I look at this and I try to put my gauge on here and, well, that's just a mess. So you have to be very careful with how much ink you put down on the plate. Without an accurate rub, you're doing extra work that you don't need to do. So when I got these castings from Jonathan, they were rough castings. I called up Keith because, well, my milling machine, when I moved, I never got it put back together and I need to mill these and I wanted to scrape in the mill. So I called up Keith Rocker and said, hey, Keith, um, can I come over and use your shop for a day? And he goes, oh, sure, Dale, come on down. So Keith, thank you very much for letting me use your shop. I know you don't let that happen very often, so I feel very honored. After we've ground it, now, the ground surface is too smooth to actually get a proper inking on this. Because what happens when you press it together, thing just kind of smushes out, and it has no place to really go, so you don't get an accurate reading. Next up, we want to take a look at our casting, and we want to develop a strategy here, because it's either going to be concave or bowed. So what we do is we do something called hinging. And hinging is when you pivot the piece, where you want it to end up is you want it to pivot here and here. So you're going in about a third. If it pivots there, it's pivoting here, and it's pivoting here. So what that's telling me is this is not straight. Let's see actually how this side does. So it's pivoting here, it's pivoting here, so you obviously could tell that it hasn't been completely scraped. But by pivoting it or hinging it, it's gonna tell us a story. Right now, I know I've got a high spot here. So what that means is, if I were to do a rub on this right now, 
it wouldn't be an accurate rub because I might push here, or I might push here. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to pre-scrape this. And I'm not going to do a lot of heavy scraping. I'm going to go over it with a medium scraper and we're just going to do a quick scrape on this and then we're going to bring it back to the granite surface plate and study it again. Another key component to scraping is stability. You need a way to clamp the material down. I've got here a magnetic chuck. This works great. I'm also on an incredibly heavy cast iron cable. So when I'm scraping, I am making sure most of my energy is going into the part and not into the wobbling of a bench. Now here's something really cool. Because this is a magnetic chuck, I can use magnetic V-blocks clamp this in and now I've got a flat surface to scrape on for that 45. But now we're going to work on the back side and we're going to just do a quick light scrape over the whole thing. And we're doing it out of 45 and I don't have to hit a hundred percent. Now I'm going to go 45 degrees in the other direction and this is serving me two things. One is it's averaging out and cutting these other scrapes in half so I'm getting more bearing surfaces, trying to get again to that 40 points. The other thing is it prevents you from getting chatter, and that's the other thing you want to worry about. So let's go on this side, same routine. We're not trying to get 100%. Now we've raised up thousands of little burrs. So I'm going to take my sharpening stones here. These are actually ground flat. And I'm just going to go over this, get rid of any of the burrs, bring over my surface plate now. Normally I would not be moving the surface plate back and forth. I actually wouldn't be moving it at all. But I do keep where I'm scraping and my surface plate separate because these filings have a tendency to stick to the oil paint and that's just not fun. All right, now let's see what happens if we pivot this again. Okay, so we're still high in the center. So before I ink this up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rescrape just the center. I would like to get it, and the reason I want to do that is this could rock when I'm inking it, so I'm not going to get a good rub. So I want to just clear out the center a little bit, try to lower it a bit so I don't have a problem with bad scraping. Now there's other techniques you could do for this. I've just found that works for me. And I'm going to be a little more aggressive. Now, edges can be really hard on castings. So when these cool, one of the things you've got to be worried about is this edge, because it's so thin, will cool faster, therefore it'll harden up. So you've got to make sure when you mill and grind this that you get all the way through that. And just test it with a file. Come over to the side, does it skip? If it comes over to this side and it doesn't skip, you know you need to mill and grind a little bit more on it. Let me show you what I did to get this through. So I actually went in with the bigger scraper, this one, just powered through it. And you can just see kind of on that finish of how much I had to take down. But let's look at it a little more detailed. So I've got a 1000 chim here. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to see if I can put it under there. This will also give me a little bit more of the story of what I need to do. I should have done this at the beginning, just didn't think about it. So I'm coming under here just a little bit. But overall, this is excellent. This may not be, this may not be that hard a scrape to get lined up. Now I'm going to blue this and I'll show you what it looks like after it's been blued. Now you can see what I've got. Hollow, hollow, hollow. So we're just going to concentrate on these blue areas. Again, this is why I went with a lot thicker rub because it really gave me some great information with having a lot of paint hit this. If I would have went really thin, it just showed a little there and a little there and wouldn't have helped me out at all. We're going to stay with the big, the big one, here. one here. With this, I'm going to do pretty much 100% straight. In other words, there's not going to be a lot of blue left over when I'm done. I'm going to hit these areas a little lighter. When I was scraping on this, you can see it right there that I went 100% in one direction, then I pretty much just cut it in half from there. I don't want to go too much. I don't know how far off I am. Now this is when it's always good to have 
paint thinner around because I like to clean off the yellow because it starts to get really sticky after a while and it gums up my stone. So we're going to stone this again. We actually, because these are precision ground, we're actually getting to read a little bit of a story here of what's going on. See these little, see that little facet right there? That was a real high spot. The stone knocked it down, but I'm going to take my medium scraper and I'm just going to go in there and knock that out. I got a couple there. That one was just really big. So let's stone it again. Always, remember, always smooth out your, your ink every time. There we go. Now that's working. As you can see, I don't like to waste my time. I like to get in, get it scraped. I'm going to keep going at this level. I'm going to probably stay with the big scraper, get rid of this and this. When I start getting ink here in the center, that's why I'm going to switch to the medium scraper. I finished up my first round of scraping with the bigger scraper with the 140 centimeter radius. And you see, I've got my blue spots pretty well spread out, fairly even, so I'm actually ready to go down to the medium tool with about a 90. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start cutting these in half. Now, I may be a little premature on that. We're going to probably take the bigger ones, take them out completely. But as they're smaller, we're just going to kind of work around it. But before we go into that, I want to talk about using the bigger scraper and one of the techniques you use with it. Sometimes you're trying to move as much volume as possible and you're doing a 100% scrape. That means every bit of this is going to get scraped. But I caution you, is it can get out of control really quick that all of a sudden, you know, you go over this a couple times, you're out of thousands and a half, remember, by just going three rounds. So what I've done here is you'll see there's actually a checkerboard pattern. And what happens is where these lines are, those are lower, and where in between is actually a little bit higher. And that's a great way to control how much you're erasing at one time. Because really, you're removing a lot of material sometimes, especially when, well, let me say, in relative terms, you're removing a lot of material. So if each time I scrape this with a big scraper, I'm moving a half a thousandth at its deepest point, well, that's a lot of material. Like I say, it can get away from you really easy. So just be careful. This may be a good plan to go. If things are starting to go a little wonky on you, go with that. And then you can see where your high spots are and then attack the high spots. So let's get on to this one. And another thing I haven't really talked in too much detail is, is going in a 45 degree angle this way and then coming this way. That averages out your strokes. I like, like to start on one side. And I'm still staying with a pretty long stroke around half inch, three quarters of an inch because I'm not close enough yet. And again, I'm not scraping 100%, I'm scraping about 80. As you can see, I'm kind of hunting around and going after the blue spots, but I'm still working on consistency. The length of my scrapes are all the same length. The angle that I'm scraping is all the same length because we need to develop that consistency because you'll find out when you measure things, you need to have it predictable so you know what you're doing is right or wrong. Now we're getting a pretty nice rub, as you can see. We're starting to get within Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. About ten points, and that's about where I want to be using this scraper. Having some challenges here, have a hollow spot there. I'm going to continue this, and I'll bring you back when we're ready for the next level of scraping. We're now going on to going for 20 points. This is looking really good. Got kind of a hollow area right here, which is kind of frustrating. Just to recap. We went in with the big scraper, this 140 centimeter radius. We worked with this scraper with a different tip in it, and its tip was 90 centimeter radius. Now we're actually going to go to 60 on this, and we're going to start chipping out even smaller pieces. Now, one of the things you'll notice when you're scraping is because this radius is so much sharper that you actually end up having more control. And where your habit with this one here is to just go in get big heavy strokes because you got to get a lot of weight behind it to get it started. This one here has such little resistance that you can go in and scrape much shorter and more precise. So I'm going to go through this whole thing. I'm going to be careful about this hollow spot. When I say hollow spot, as you can see, there's no high spots making it lower. I'll bring you back after we get to a really nice solid look of spots on this. I'm going to take this down to 20. Now, I know one of the questions is going to ask, well, how many times do you have to ink it and come back and forth, back and forth until you got it to where you need it? 
well, let's talk about this. So there's different levels. So the first level we went with, with the larger scraper with 140 centimeter radius, I probably did five passes. Now we're at probably around 20, crudely around 20 points. Well, yeah, maybe 15 points. Some of them are a little large and need to be cut in half, but you get the idea is to get to where I'm at here probably took another five rounds, okay? But now when we start getting into really refining to a 20, it may take 10, 15 times going back and forth. So that's a long process. I think I'm a little bit faster than most. I don't know, but uh, it's a long process. So I'm going to get back to scraping, see if I can't get this all finished up soon. So you guys get an idea of where we're at now. This is looking great. If I put this on here, we're sitting at about 15 points. The points are pretty large. So now what we're going to do is actually physically start cutting the points in half now. When we're inking this up, this here is what I would call a medium ink. So it's not thick. If it was thick right now, it would cover this whole thing in blue. In medium, it looks like this. If I went thinner than this, we'd be looking more in this area here. So again, look at how thick your ink or your, paint, your pigment is. And be very careful on that because you can get a false reading. Like it's really thin here, really thick here. But my experience, I know where I'm I'm out on this. So now what we're going to do is physically just cut these in half. And you can see what we're trying to do by just cut, cutting it in half. I'm trying to be really careful to show you guys and I'm just not getting the rhythm. So now let's look at this. You can see the spots are a lot smaller. This is the way you start getting down to, let's see how many points we have here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. We're at around 24 points here. But to me, it's not a 220 because it's not consistent enough. Now, this may be good enough for the machine you're working on. Right now, if I was working the ways on a bridge port, I'm darn close. I'm probably about two, three scrapes away before I've got it just the way I'd want it for a bridge port, but we're taking this, to the we're now getting down to the final stretch. We're getting a really consistent area of spots. Still a little thin here, still a little thin here, but overall it's looking great. Now, now I want to talk about how to read the spots themselves, and that's where it gets tricky. But when you start to think of it logically, you'll see what I'm talking about. If we take one of these spots in this area, you'll see that there's a dark rim around it, and the height and in the center, it's thin. It's thin because that's a high point. So you got to think of it as a mountain where when the blue touches it on the surface plate, it actually squeegees out and goes down to the side. And that's what we're seeing here. And we're getting to that point where we're scraping dots, OK? Some people call it hunting and pecking. Um, well, you'll see why here in a second. We're going to actually come in here with a scraper. And we're just going to be looking for the centers and we're just going to bump them. And we're just after centers. Now, I will tell you I'm a little premature on center doing this part here because I've got too many low spots, but I want to show you that and I want to also get this video done. Another way of doing it, Tom Lipton came up with this basic concept and it's a bump scraper. And it allows you to come in with a very controlled amount of force and you just tap, 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 tap. Now, I built one of these. The first one I made didn't work. I changed the design. I went around to a very flexible tip here. This is actually spring steel. But I was still having a problem. I had a lot of problem with chatter. So you could look at the cut, and it was chattered through. So I called up Tom, and I said, hey, Tom, what are the challenges you're having, and what did you do to fix the chatter? And what he ended up doing was he actually set up the hammer part and put a bronze bush in there so it doesn't vibrate. Because you can imagine that vibration transfers through and chatters. And he also put a rubber hose here. And between those, it absorbed the vibration and gave it a smooth cut. What I did was I went in with a couple O-rings and a plastic disc. And that's the way I absorbed the vibration. So let's back up and talk about the three threes. Again, we talk about how do we control how we're scraping. Well, we do that with pressure, length of stroke, and also the shape of the cutter itself. Number two, 
we think about the inking, and there's three steps in the inking, a real thick coat, a thin coat, and then when you're really getting refined past 40 points, well, you get into actually new, doing no inking, and you just end up getting mirrored surfaces. Then we talk about a real coarse scraping to just remove a lot of material, and we use usually a bigger, more extensive radius like this, which is 140 centimeters. Then after the coarse, and we've got some big splotches that are consistently spread over, we go to a more refined, like a 90 radius, and we start breaking that down, and we get that within, I don't know, 15 points or so. Then we want to get to 20 points is where most machines are scraped to. We end up using a 60 centimeter radius. And now since this is actually going to be a reference surface, I'm going to take it past 40. And it's a long process. And I think it might be kind of boring to watch the whole thing, but you'll get to see it in other videos. So I don't know if you guys have noticed this sitting in the corner. This is actually a slow speed grinder or a sharpener that I built, and there's actually a video coming out for this, so look for that. And in that video, I'm gonna cover something I didn't cover in this video, and that's how to sharpen all these cutters and how I approach it using the slow speed grinder. And also in that uh, video, I show you how I made this entire thing. So, all right, guys, I want you to go out and take, take this on, challenge it, like I said. You can use very simple tools. You can just use file if you like to. It's not that, not that big a deal. Remember, we're about going out in the shop and building something cool. So, so that's the conclusion of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. There's a lot of material. The best way to learn it is to just go out in your shop and do it. It's not that big a deal. Just go for it. Also, if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that little bell. And until next time, go out in your shop, build something cool. Thanks.